and welcome to Physics-Based Animation. My name is David Levine, and I'll be your instructor as we explore this fascinating aspect of computer graphics. Before we begin, I want to point out that whether you are taking this course for credit or just out of interest, all the required information can be found on the course GitHub page, which is available at the link on the slides. This includes all the videos that correspond to these lectures, the course schedule, assignments, grading scheme, academic honesty policy, really anything that you want to know about the course. So please, if you have questions, check here first. The goal of this course is to provide a fairly in-depth introduction to the use of computational physics for generating computer animations. Hopefully this course will appeal to you whether you are just interested in an overview of physics-based animation, are a user of physics-based animation software, or are aiming to do cutting-edge research in the field. While this course will require a certain amount of mathematical acumen, it assumes no previous experience with physics or physics simulation. To get started, we're going to begin with an introduction, or a review depending on your background, of some basic concepts of physics simulation using a simple mass spring as our model problem. We will relatively quickly see how these concepts can be applied to more complex geometries with more complex behaviors like this elasticity simulation of this armadillo or the simulation of this hanging piece of cloth. And finally, even exploring things like contact handling in the context of rigid bodies. By the way, these were all screenshots from the assignments which you will have implemented by the time you complete the course. But before we get to all of that, I want to start by talking a little bit about where physics-based animation fits in the pantheon of graphics pursuits. Physics-based animation is an interesting field. It uses concepts from numerical methods, math, and physics, but it's fundamentally a computer graphics pursuit. Computer graphics itself is made up of really three core areas, modeling, rendering, and animation. Modeling is really concerned with specifying the geometric and appearance properties of a shape. And you can do this either mathematically or in some other way, such that they can be stored on a computer. In this example, we see a curved surface mesh, which is being displayed using a very simple lighting model in the open source modeling tool Blender. The design and the specification of this shape broadly constitute the act of modeling. The display of the shape itself is what we use rendering for. So rendering concerns itself with modeling how light interacts with the world and using this model to produce an image. This is arguably the most well-known graphics pursuit. When we see movies or we play video games, it's the rendering that typically elicits the lion's share of the reactions and the discussion. But I really think that it's the final core area of graphics animation which brings computer graphics to life. More often than not, when you're looking at a movie or a video game or you're in VR, it's the motion that provides the personality or the realism, at least as much or more so than realistic rendering. The price of this hard work generating this motion is the time and effort of an incredibly skilled animator. However, some things that are really hard to animate by hand well actually have a concise description using the laws of physics. And this is really what physics-based animation is about. We're going to see how physics can generate complex, believable motions from relatively small amounts of input. And this is going to be useful for animating things such as these falling penguins, which would be very hard to do by hand with all of the deformation and contact that's happening between them. Here we see another example. This horse was created for the movie Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, and here the physics is handling the animation of the muscles, skin, and hair, leaving the animator in control of the motion of the horse's skeleton. And all of this yields fairly spectacular results. 
Physics simulation can be used to generate effects other than just animation. For instance, here, both the motion and the sound of the slinky are simulated, meaning that you get perfect synchronization between the two. This leads to a much more realistic and responsive experience than could be achieved via manual Foley artistry. Concepts from physics simulation can also be applied to problems other than direct synthesis of motion or sound. For instance, here, basic rules of physics are used to construct the trajectories of colliding objects from single viewpoint video, such as the collision that happens between this rubber ducky and this rugby ball. Ultimately, if we want to create realistic, large-scale virtual worlds, we have to leverage the ability to generate and understand complicated physical interactions from what we will see are a relatively simple set of rules. So where do we begin? Well, we begin with something you have all likely seen before, and that is Newton's laws of motion. In fact, this course can be understood as learning how to build algorithms that implement these three laws. Newton's first law says that every object will remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled to change its state by the action of an external force. The second law says that the, the force acting on an object is equal to the time rate of change of the momentum. And the third law says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now, our first goal is to translate these descriptions into mathematical principles that we can eventually implement. So we'll begin by laying out a bit of notation that's going to help us do that. Here's a very simple example physical system, a single particle. Now this particle is going to have a position in space, which we're going to denote by x as a function of time, t. It's going to have a velocity in space, given by v of t, which is the time derivative of the position. It has an acceleration in space a, which is the second time derivative of the position. And finally, it has a scalar mass denoted by m. Now, because this is a physics class, units are important. We are going to use SI units, which typically means meters for distance, kilograms for mass. Finally, I want to draw your attention to a few notational conventions. With a few exceptions, scalar quantities like mass will be denoted by lowercase letters, and vector quantities will be denoted by lowercase boldface letters. OK, armed with these notational conventions, we will now revisit Newton's laws. In particular, it's going to be the second law that informs much of the algorithmic development in this course. This law relates the time rate of change of momentum to the force acting on an object. An object's momentum is its mass multiplied by its velocity. Time rate of change is just a fancy way of telling you to take a derivative, and Newton's second law says that this change is proportional to the force acting on the system. Finally, because our particle has constant mass, it's not growing or shrinking, we arrive at the standard statement of Newton's second law which is that mass times acceleration equals force, the famous F equals ma. When we start with such an equation of motion, which is built starting with vector quantities like force and momentum, we refer to this as vectorial mechanics. Vectorial mechanics works great when the world is already divided up into particles, but it gets trickier for more involved phenomena. Because of this, this, in this course, we are going to rely on a different but related approach called variational mechanics, also known as analytical mechanics. Variational mechanics does away with vectorial quantities and instead derives laws of motion from two fundamental scalar energies, the so-called kinetic and potential energies. Kinetic energy is the energy due to motion, due to the momentum of the object while potential energy is some internal stored energy. It can be the electrical charge of a particle or the internal stresses induced by stretching an elastic band. It's basically stored energy that has the potential to become kinetic energy by inducing motion. Let's see a perhaps familiar example. Let's say I'm sitting on top of the CN tower. If all is well, my kinetic energy should be zero. In fact, 
most of you are familiar with basic kinetic energy. It's the one-half mass times velocity squared, which you tend to run into in pre-university physics classes. Because I'm safe and sound on top of this Yen Tower, well, my velocity is zero, so my kinetic energy is zero. My potential energy is due to gravity and being high off the ground. The higher I am and heavier I am, the more potential energy I'm storing. This is reflected in the standard formula for potential energy, mass times gravity times height. Here, g is the scalar acceleration due to gravity, and h is my height above the ground. If things were to go badly, this potential energy would be converted into kinetic energy, something we definitely don't want to happen here. So variational mechanics is going to allow us to synthesize equations of motion using these two types of energies via something called a variational principle. Variational principles rely on functionals like this. A functional is a map from a function and its derivatives to the real numbers. Here, the functional e takes in the function f and its derivatives with respect to time. Rather than cumbersomely write d by dt, I've switched to the common dot notation, wherein a dot over a function denotes the total time derivative. In variational mechanics, the function f is going to become the path of our physical object in space, and we will use something called the calculus of variations to find the right function f that obeys the appropriate physical laws. Applying variational mechanics requires a few extra bits and pieces, the first of which being the notion of generalized coordinates. Don't let the word generalized fool you. Generalized coordinates are just the name we give to the actual variables parametrizing a motion. What these coordinates are exactly is a choice we make when designing our simulation. We then create a function which uses these generalized coordinates to compute the actual position of our object in the real world, and this real world position is denoted by x of t. Because the generalized coordinates are a function of time, we can compute the velocity of our object by taking the time derivative of this function composition. This yields a velocity in the generalized coordinate space, q dot, and a set of derivatives, which we call the Jacobian, and this Jacobian maps this velocity into the world space velocity we know and love. Let's look at a couple of examples to make this all a bit more concrete. The simplest possible case is a particle moving in space. In this case, we can simply choose our generalized coordinate q to be the position of the center of the particle. If our particle is in 3D, then q is just a 3D vector. The generalized velocity and the world space velocity then become the same. Another way to say that is that our Jacobian is the identity map. If we want to include some rotation into our motion, we can make a different choice of q. We can define the motion of our object using a rigid transform, Rigid transforms are parameterized by a rotation and a translation. And here our rotation is codified as a three by three matrix, which is a member of the special orthogonal group. And our translation is just another 3D vector. Our cues become this rotation and this translation. This is really the strength of the variational approach. It gives us flexibility in determining what sorts of motions we will be able to simulate. And we'll see more examples as the course goes on. Now that we have some generalized coordinates, we can move on to building the functional we will use in variational mechanics. The root of all of this starts with Joseph Louis Lagrange, who introduced the notion of the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is nothing more than the kinetic energy of an object, T, minus its potential energy, V. I'll just point out that here, L, T, and V are all scalar functions, but we are departing from our lowercase notation to agree with historical convention. The basis of variational mechanics is the principle of least action proposed by Gottfried Leibniz, perhaps better known in history as the calculus guy. It works like this. Let's say we know the configuration of the object at two points in time, t1 and t2, where t1 happens before t2. And by configuration, I mean the value of the generalized coordinates, q. The question we are concerned with is, how do we pick a physically valid path or trajectory between these points out of all the infinite possibilities? Leibniz conjectured that this could be done by finding a stationary point of the action of the system. So let's unpack that statement a little bit. 
The action is a functional that maps q and its time derivatives to a scalar value. Specifically, it is the integral of the Lagrangian, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, over time. When we talk about extremizing a functional, we are really talking about finding a flat spot, a trajectory, a function of q, that gives us the same value of s for any tiny perturbation. Think of a ball at the bottom of a hill. You know that you're at the bottom because if you push the ball a little bit back up the hill, it will roll back down to the same spot. Mathematically, we're going to write this like so. Here, delta q is a small arbitrary push applied to each point of q and q dot. If this push doesn't change the action, then we know q and q dot are the correct solution, at least according to Leibniz. Okay, so how do we actually find q? Well, we are going to use an incredibly useful mathematical tool called the calculus of variations. All right, let's do some calculus. First, we'll start by shortening our equation by subbing in L for the Lagrangian. And next, we'll perturb the equation. That's pretty easy. We just write in perturbations given by delta q and delta q dot. Now we're going to start simplifying things. Remember, our perturbation is arbitrary, but very small. This means that we can simplify this a bit by applying what will become a good friend of ours over the next few weeks, the Taylor expansion. The Taylor expansion, by definition, lets us split up the action into the unperturbed action and the small change in action caused by the perturbation itself. We call this small chunk the first variation. Using this approximation, we can simplify our hunt for flat spots in the action in the following way. Because the action for the unperturbed path appears on both sides of the equation, we end up just having to find a q and q dot for which the first variation of the action is equal to zero. Okay, we're back to the calculus of variations, with things already looking a lot better. We've thrown out one whole term in this equation. However, it's still a little unclear on how to proceed. We have to somehow get rid of these perturbations to be able to say anything meaningful about how to compute q and q dot. To do this, we are going to apply integration by parts. This is going to allow us to get rid of the perturbation of q dot by moving that time derivative onto the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to q dot. The price we're going to pay for doing this is the arrival of some nasty boundary conditions, which require us to know the value of this term at both t0 and t1. However, don't panic. Remember that a condition of applying the principle of least action is that we already know the configuration of the object at t1 and t2. That means that at these points, the perturbation, delta q, is actually zero. So in the end, this term just goes away, which is very polite of it. And now we are in the home stretch. Factoring out our delta q gets us almost to the end. The final step is to leverage the fact that our perturbation is arbitrary. This means that for this integral to be zero, the integrand itself must be zero at every point. Okay, so we say these magic words, and now it's okay to remove the integrand from the integral, setting it equal to zero. And this yields a differential equation, a very famous differential equation, known as the Euler-Lagrange equation. So what this means is that if we can find a function q of t, that satisfies this Euler-Lagrange equation, then we know it is a physically valid trajectory. And we're going to build the rest of the course off of this approach. All right, after all those equations, it's good to pause for a moment and remind ourselves why we care about any of this at all. So why do we care? Well, we care because variational mechanics provides us with a unifying principle, and we can derive equations of motion from more than just particles. Remember rigid body Drake? We could use the same approach to derive equations of motions for that particular setup. Deformable objects, fluids, rigid bodies, and much more can all be processed using what is essentially a turn crank mathematical solution, and therein lies the power of this approach. Now we are going to put this all on firmer ground using our good friend.
the mass spring system in one dimension. We start with a particle that can only move in 1D along the x-axis of this slide. This particle is attached to a wall at the origin by a zero rest length spring. In other words, a spring that exerts zero force when the particle is at the origin. Let's apply the Euler-Lagrange equation to this setup and see what we get. Pay attention because we are going to apply the same steps over and over again in this class just to increasingly complex physical systems. All right, step one. Let's choose some generalized coordinates. Well, just like with particle drake, many, many slides ago, we can simply use the x position of the particle as our generalized coordinate. Taking the derivative with respect to time shows us that q dot is just the one-dimensional velocity of the particle. Step two, figure out the kinetic energy in terms of q and q dot. In one dimension, this is again just the standard one-half mass times velocity squared. Since we know that velocity is just q dot, we already know the kinetic energy in terms of q dot, and hence we're done. So that was particularly simple in this case. Very good. Step three, figure out potential energy in terms of q. Okay, this is a little more involved because what we know about our spring is initially limited. We know that it has a zero rest length. We know that it's a spring, so it should always exert a force that pulls our object back towards the origin, or x equals zero. And that's about it. We're going to invoke Hooke's law, which tells us that the force is linearly proportional to the stretch in the spring. Since our spring has zero rest length and it is attached to x equals zero, the stretch is just the x position of the particle. We introduce the proportionality constant k and a negative sign to make sure the force always pulls back towards the origin. Now we are going to convert this force into a potential energy by using the fact that the change in potential energy is the negative mechanical work done on the system. Now work is the product of force and displacement, which completes the connection between force and potential energy. Here we compute the work done over an interval of time via integration. We're lucky that v times dt here is really just the infinitesimal change in position. This allows us to rewrite this integral in terms of the variable x, and integrate. This leaves us with a concise definition of potential energy, which is quadratic in x. Again, because x is equal to q in this case, we now have a definition of potential energy in terms of generalized coordinates. Now, all we have to do is evaluate the Lagrangian, which is the kinetic minus potential energy, and then evaluate all of the terms in the Euler-Lagrange equation. First, we take the derivative of L with respect to Q dot, and this recovers the momentum of the system. Next, we take the derivative of L with respect to Q, and this recovers our spring force. In the penultimate step, we take both of these terms and substitute them into the Euler-Lagrange equation, which somewhat remarkably recovers Newton's second law. Finally, we can take our time derivative, exploiting the constant mass of our particle, and arriving at the very familiar mass times acceleration equals force. This somewhat surprising result should give you confidence that there really is something to this variational mechanics stuff. So what have we really done here? Well, we've gone from a variational principle, the principle of least action, all the way to a second order ordinary differential equation. In the next lecture, we're gonna see how to solve this ordinary differential equation to generate our very first physically based animation.